So at the beginning of 2020, what I wanted to do is something for the first time, something new to me, and I'm known for innovation. And one of the things I really want to push in myself is that I'm continuously learning, evolving, growing, trying new things because I ask people to do the same thing. So one of the things that I wanted to try this year was a podcast. And what started as something that I was just doing solo, to be honest with you, in my basement, hooked up into my microphone, because I just wanted to start. I just wanted to see, and I, I felt that I, I didn't want to wait to have like all these pieces put together and all these things. I just started it. And it was beautiful because I got to share my thoughts with the world and you know share just individual thoughts. But when COVID happened, I really wanted to have an opportunity to bring guests in, to bring in different perspectives, to bring in uh, different voices and hear some of the challenges that they're facing, some of the success that they had. And so for 2020, it was, it was absolutely beautiful to have so many great conversations with so many great people, learning about education outside their personal aspects. And also, to be honest with you, uh, I started doing some podcasts with my daughter. And it was one of my favorite things. It's something that I know that I'm going to look back uh, on you know, as I grow older. So what we've done here is we've actually compiled just some short clips uh, to kind of take a look back at some of the best advice that we got from our guests this year and, and really at the end, a, a really special guest, my own daughter, Kalia, uh, on the pa podcast. So I hope you enjoy it and thank you for watching. I I'm looking forward to uh, continued conversations with amazing guests in 2021. Thanks. The attitude gap is the gap between those students who have the will and that's the key word, the will to achieve excellence in those who do not. So me as, as teacher, me as principal, the emphasis was always on the will and not the skill. I said, if, if, if we can change the will or increase the will, the skill will follow because the youngster is walking into the building every day brilliant. The youngster is walking into the building every day amazing, but there are real life circumstances that youngster is dealing with and it doesn't manifest or youngster may not even realize his or her brilliance. So, so my approach was let's, let's go in on the will of youngster to get youngster excited about self, about learning, about the prospects for his or her future. What I try and live, and we kind of talked about this quote before, is that promote what you love instead of bashing what you hate. Mm -hmm. And that is not my quote, and I wish I know who said it, yeah. um, because I use it all the time. But not only do I use the quote, like that's how I live my life. That mm -hmm. is when you say like, oh yeah, Lori, lots of people feel like Lori's a cheerleader. That's yeah. because that's what I live by, yeah. right? That's why people know what restaurants I like and what bands I listen to and who my idols are, because that's what I do, I, I choose that. And I think so that's, that's to me what it's about. It's about cheering people on and it's about mm -hmm. um, stepping out of my world to um, show gratitude and to show love to people that, that make it better. And I, I hope to do that for them too. So yeah, I think um, you're right. Like kindness is, um, it can be a really simple definition. It can be a really complex definition, but for me, it's just more of a way of living and, and that's what it boils down to. The great thing about Genius Hour for staff is that right now, different staff are very interested in a variety of things, sometimes for their own uh, learning and professional development, but oftentimes because they want to be better at this new reality, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, teachers want to be good at teaching, whether it's blended, right. online, in-person, that type of thing. And I think what a genius hour allows them to do is like, it like gives them permission and almost um, celebrates the idea and makes time for the idea that their professional learning doesn't have to be about some new program, right? And it doesn't even need to be about some new technology. Right. Maybe they want to learn about choice boards because they saw somebody, you know, tweet out that choice boards are a great way to get kids learning. Or maybe they want to learn about hyperdocs because it seems perfect uh, in distance learning for allowing kids to choose their own path. Now they have time in a genius hour to explore those things. Uh, and it's, it's given them permission to kind of dive deep. And the cool thing about it is if you do that with staff and then they present out what they've been learning and their findings, 
now it gives permission to everybody else to talk to this person, that person, that person, and say, hey, that's so cool. You learned all about that choice boards. How could I do that? It can be indicative of like, I do everything I've always done. Here's the worksheets, hand these out. We've got 10 minutes left, hop on the Chromebooks. Like if we're doing it for that reason, don't buy them because it is a waste of money in that regard. And that's why the pedagogy piece, I, I have to tell you, at least, and you probably get this too, but at least once a month, it literally this time of year, it's probably once a week where districts are doing their budget and they're planning. I will get an email from a principal that says something along this, and you could change the numbers based on the side of the district. Hey, Tom, uh, four years ago, we went one-to-one. -one. We're looking at refreshing in the fall. It's going to cost $1.6 million. Our board, since it's budget season, is an analyzing. In the past four years, our scores, and we could talk about that, mm -hmm. obviously, our scores haven't increased much in the past four years. So our, our board is saying, you know, if, um, why are we buying these devices again if not a whole lot has changed? And that shows, like, the access and the opportunity is one part of the conversation. But if we don't shift what we do with right. it and just digitize what we've done, like, it's, it's not worth the money. And that that's where it's the explore, the design, the create. What came to mind was the G in great stands for grateful. So just be grateful for um, the intangible, intangible things that you receive every single day. And that, that costs no money, takes a little bit of time. The R stands for relational. Be relationship, relationship oriented. And then start thinking about positivity, but there's no P in great enthusiasm is there authenticity is one that i really struggle with so i'll put that in there because that's something i want to become better at and then i'm a i think i look at myself as a constant learner so instead of learning i use t or teachable so be great sense for be grateful relational enthusiastic authentic and teachable looking for the happy accidents or beautiful lessons and everything we experience I think that leads to living a richer, more fulfilled and happier life. And not everything is roses. And I am an optimist, but I do realize that there is a whole spectrum of emotions that we've been given that, um, you know, in themselves are pretty beautiful and can teach us things. And things really suck in the moment. But I also think that if we are continuously looking for the gifts that every experience, like COVID-19 to, you know, my experience of losing my mom to like joys beyond our imagination, like all of those things teach us something. And if we look for them, I think life is much better. When you're actually hearing and you're finding common spaces, you're finding the places that you agree and you're, you're actually highlighting some of the places that you value and by listening, not speaking, by listening, we can actually change people quite significantly. I think that's really important. Um, you know, in the work that we're trying to change people, like I, I hope that people, you know, who want me to think differently will listen to some of the expertise that I have because I know that some of the work that I do can be beneficial to others. But I also know, and this is really important, that a ton of work that other people can do is beneficial to me. And I want to learn from that. I want to grow. Um, and so really kind of sharing that. So really when we ever go back to whatever school likes in the, looks like in the future, um, just really remember that there is overwhelming evidence that the majority of people will change when they know it's beneficial to kids. My favorite classes that I had for most of my career was when I would get a class of uh, students that were identified as ELL or ESL. Um, and, and just for your audience, please be mindful of the fact that all of us are ELL at some point in our life. So there's a stigma attached to ELL students that we need to get rid of. All of us are ELL at some point in our life. Now, with that being said, one of the things that I noticed is that, you know, when you have ELL or ESL students, there are obviously is some degree of a language restrictor. Well, guess how you can remove that barrier, the tech. So for me, one of the things that I used to always do is any type of instruction that I did or any type of, 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 let's say project parameters that I would provide for the students, it would be in English and it would be in their language. See, now I'm making it accessible. Now, in many cases, I couldn't speak their language. I mean, I'm, I'm decent with Spanish and, and several other languages, Italian and French, but, but not fluent. Did an interesting exercise with a group of teachers the other day, just as a sort of a, a, an opening uh, part of a session I did, as I asked them, when was the last time you were validated? And that was a really good conversation because it, it, to your point, 
a lot of people feel validation in different ways. Like sometimes it's very public where someone, oh, I, my principal said, good job. Right. Somebody got a note from a parent. Somebody just, uh, I, I can't remember, it was a really interesting sort of point of validation. Like it was like this nonverbal situation where, and again, I'm, I'm making this up, but to make the point right. said like all my students came on time. Like I felt like Val, so when you think, when you start, I think as leaders, that's actually a really good question to ask mm -hmm. people because to your point, then you begin to understand what, what constitutes validation for people and what they find really valuable and what others like. When I say, okay, mama, let's go. We're in this together. This baby doesn't have a dad. He's been in care for three years and he has a history of sexual abuse. I have then a group of people, bus drivers, custodians, EAs that are like, he, he, he doesn't have a mom. He, he, he doesn't have right. breakfast in the morning. And then all of a sudden, these same people who were scared of this baby are stepping off their bus, walking him into school. The secretary, the administrative assistant is like, hey, good morning, Jackson with an X, high five. Ooh, what the, how's those Pokemon guys going? And these kids are like, what in the name of Jesus is happening here, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And listen, it, it takes, relationship knows no hierarchy. Kids do not know the difference between the superintendent, the principal and the bus driver. Nor, the, nor do they care. And when relationship knows no hierarchy, we start to create a group of teachers, right? Not just the teacher. The, the definition of a teacher is anybody who walks you home and, and gives, imparts knowledge, imparts wisdom, imparts caring. Our learners to see and own and drive their learning, they not only do better in terms of their connectedness, their engagement, their persistence, but their achievement also goes up to higher rates than, than uh, you know, you saw before. I'm a data guy, I love data and statistics and I, mm -hmm. I track this stuff, uh, you know, meticulously. And, and there's a very common pattern when schools or classrooms make this shift where academic achievement starts to go down initially. Uh, and what I call engagement metrics like attendance and discipline right. and attitudes about school, they get better. And uh, if you only look at that, academic achievement short term, you tend to go back to what is known and comfortable and you, you plateau. But if you believe that if students persist and they have good attitudes about school and that they're uh, engaging more, that that eventually will translate to higher achievement, that is what happens. Mental health um, uh, support for our, for our teachers and how to recognize those things. Obviously, we're looking to more trauma-informed practices. But um, the thing that I think is going to be the biggest, um, the biggest part that's going to help us, George, is that we've always tried to go out of our way to build that social capital with families and students, mm -hmm. you know, even before this happened. And I think continuing to do that during this time is critical. So easy, small things like, hey, you know, you know those students that you had last year, there was no closure, right, for that for for that school year. You know, starting the new year right with those with, with those kids and just having some closure. You know, you can set up a time in which whatever platform you use, you can have students come in, you can talk to them, they can talk to their peers, right? And then the other part is the other part of that is making sure that like throughout the school year, now every teacher is almost like a case manager, right? There's these three types of learning that I'm gonna talk about today that I talk about in an innovate side the box that I think are really crucial to the work that we do. And we need to put more emphasis on these three types of learning um, in the role of educator. And so the first one I'm gonna talk about is uh, learning for your kids, which obviously you're doing right now and all the opportunities that we have, um, but learning about your kids, who are they? Um, you know, what, what drives them, what, what their passions are, what their strengths are, how do we tap into that? And then learning with your students and how do we actually create spaces where we not only learn, um, our students learn from us as educators, but we learn from our students as well and our students learn from one another. There is something that has to happen in this building where our students walk in and they understand that they're not failing. Where teachers are going to need a culture shift where they understand that this is not a dumping ground school. And in order to do that, in order to create this change, I want to meet with every student in this building for one minute. And we had 430 students at the time. So I knew that 430 minutes would be a huge investment in our building if I was able to take what the students said and make change happen in our building.
And that first iteration of one minute meetings, I asked them three questions. How are you doing today? What's your greatest celebration from the past nine weeks? And what's been your greatest challenge? When I tell you, it opened my eyes so much to, to really think about the fact that it, what the things that those students shared with me had nothing to do with English language arts, nothing to do with math, science, or social studies, had nothing to do with the extracurriculars we were offering, and everything to do with who they were. The first thing that we need to, to, to kind of realize about the connection and the technology piece is, is it's never really been about the device at the same time, the connection. And the, the reason I say that is because right now, what our people are realizing is the connection comes in so many different mediums, like you're mentioning with the audio, with the video and that kind yeah. of thing. We, I just, we just told our people, you need to connect with, like I told them, you can't do this wrong if you connect with kids. You can do this wrong if you push content and expect kids to just know and understand what they do. And then what's a site-based decision and what's a teacher's-based decision? Right. And so that grounding around, hey, this is what we're holding in common. So that's where you know I'm going to push really, really hard because that's something we've agreed that we are all as a system holding in common. This is a site-based decision. So I might be giving you feedback on that and saying, hey, here's some things I'm hearing that you're saying or here's some things I'm doing. I'm curious about this. I wonder what this would do. What if you thought about it this way? And the same with a classroom-based decision. And so I think that helps empower people to say, okay, I do get to make a lot of the decisions on my own. And yet I have this backing and support. And some of that comes from finding those bright spots and figuring out how do you highlight the hack out of somebody who has tried something new whether it worked or not right. and say hey isn't this awesome so and so tried something new and look what happened for the learner an assistant principal in our district super smart and she recently said to me kind of what you're talking about she's like we started we were all pumped or excited She's like, but in the end, people are going to remember how we end, not how we started. So how are we going to wow. make sure that we end well, right? And, and she's right. I don't want to see people collapse at the finish line, if you will, right? I want to see people get through the finish line. They're going to be tired. They're going to be exhausted, but they're going to be pumped because of what they accomplished and because of what they could do moving forward. So for me, it's about finding that spot where people feel like they're, they're going to finish. They may be hurting a little when they finish but they're gonna be, be empowered by what they accomplish because what they accomplish is nothing short of extraordinary. I mean, we literally launched online schools in, in days mm -hmm. and, and teachers who, who were nervous about technology or who lived in, in places where the internet is not strong. I mean, I live in a community where our, our internet is kind of shoddy at home, it is what it is. Um, they were like, we're gonna make it work. So if I need to go sit right next to the router or if I need to wake up at the crack of dawn so I can record videos for my kids or if I need to stay up late, whatever it is, we're going to do it. Um, and so now we have to make sure that we sustain ourselves because we cannot allow ourselves to collapse under the pressure of what is a lag, you know? And, and, and so that's about having open conversations. That's about chunking experiences so you don't see the next month and a half, just see the next hour, just see the next day. And then also making a point of celebrating the things that have gone well and, and acknowledging those things and relying on them. And, and the last thing we've talked about recently is how can we crowdsource resources and ideas and, and activities and learning, you know, units of study, like as a collective, instead of feeling like we have to burden it, you know, mm -hmm. carry the burden individually, because you don't. If you're a strong first grade teacher, there are the strong first grade teachers out there. How can you partner with them? How can you share resources and ideas with them so you're not always recreating the wheel? have the phone, if it's constantly with them, if it's tethered to them, why not say, okay, I want to encourage you to use that phone, but here's how I want you to use it. You know, it's kind of like, rather than remove it, why not teach the, or, or, or support the use of it that benefits you? And here's a true story. It was uh, uh, not too long ago, the AP exams, which again, another podcast episode for us to talk about that garbage. So the AP exam shifted to online because they can't do it in person. And AP exams by design are already inequitable because most, in many cases, and for, for your audience, there's a couple of things. One, here's how AP is inequitable. One, you have to have an AP teacher on campus. That AP teacher has to be certified. 
So now think about how many schools are in a position to hire a teacher and then financially support them becoming certified to teach the class where the primary purpose of the class is to take the exam that you also have to pay. Take care of yourself. This is hard work. Um, it's emotional. It's draining at times, but it's incredibly rewarding. So please take care of yourself and never forget, um, you know, you're, you're wonderful for what you're doing right now and continue these connections that you've built during this time. Um, I, I think that is so important that if when we move back into a more traditional environment again, that we remain connected and we don't forget uh, what brought us together like this. Um, I know it's easy to forget sometimes, but um, sharing together, collaborating, continuing to develop our professional learning community, elevating each other. Um, we have to continue to see the good in everyone because we're here for kids. Do it's best for kids, not best for kids only in one place of, you know, of the world or in one school. So that's something that really thinking about how do we actually think, rethink the way that we're doing this process. And I know like I'm sharing ideas. I know a lot of people do already just some of my experience. And so those three points was like, how do we make it comfortable? You know, people feel welcome when they come in. Um, how do we make it more conversational as opposed to the, the back and forth, you know, super uh, uncomfortable. And I feel sometimes people actually want to do that, which I don't understand at all, but really want to make it conversational that we're, we're getting to know, you know, the more than just answers, but how we connect and really how do we actually help every single candidate that we go through this process to actually be better for education, whether they uh, get a job um, in, our, in our school or not. Happiness uh, has the power to turn on all of the learning centers of the brain. That's what dopamine can do for us. And yet we don't really talk a lot explicitly about happiness and um, or mirror neurons, right? Like whatever energy I bring into the virtual or in-person space, like that person's probably going to mirror. So like self-care is a community act. Like I care for myself. I show up in really healthy ways. This person who showed up to the same space is more likely to mirror um, that for me. And there's a statistic that I love that Sean uh, shares that says, Sean Aker said that your brain on positive is 31% more productive than it is at negative, neutral, or stress. Things that are carrying us through. It's not the academics, it's relationships. And as we start to think about going back to school, the fact of the matter is many of our schools are gonna have to go back in hybrid models where our touch points with kids are gonna be fewer than ever before and our proximity to kids is gonna be less than it ever was before. And as such, those relationships are going to be more important than ever before because relationships are the driver. And so when you start to look at relationships and SEL, what we discovered when you look at your work, when you look at the work coming out of the Gates Foundation, you look at Brene Brown's work, my wife and I did this sort of meta-analysis of like all of the work that's being done on relationships. And what we discovered was when you look at all of that work, there are 12 habits that bubble up of people who are highly effective at cultivating relationships with kids in masterful classrooms. I started to realize the power of my voice. And while still being in media, I was still teaching. And now I'm seeing as an educator and an entrepreneur and a speaker that we have so many budding like speakers in our classrooms that we're not doing enough to build and amplify those voices. We're focusing on excellence and eloquence. We are making sure that they're able to present an oral presentation like at a level four, but in terms of encouraging our students to own their voice, appreciate their voice, be comfortable enough to not only share their big idea and their project, but to talk about their feelings and you know what life is for them, we're not doing that enough. So Slay the My Junior aims to help students feel comfortable with their voice beyond the classroom. So just in general, loving the sound of their voice, saying what they want to say, um, it helps to build that confidence. It's really important. I think a lot of us went into this thinking, okay, so we're going to start this e-learning and it's going to be kind of like what we did in the classroom only. It's going to be online. Um, and right. then we got home and we have families who are also trying to do e-learning and we're mm -hmm. trying to do our jobs and we're trying to just 
be a family, be a unit, um, and figure out what this new normal is for us. And people realized really quickly, okay, so I'm not going to have this scheduled day that at this time, everybody in my class is going to be doing this and then this and then this. Um, and so actually for next week for our e-learning, our teachers um, are sending out a grid um, that our parents can kind of select from. And they send out an email then every day at a certain time, kind of letting everybody know what's going on for the day with some suggestions. But it's really up to the families as far as what they're picking and choosing um, and then submitting to the teachers. But it's, it's very flexible and it's very, um, just very, very based on, and understanding that we're all kind of learning new things at, at one time. We need consistency, we need connection, but we also need flexibility. It's will. We, we had to elevate our thinking. We were celebrating kids losing because we met benchmarks. But, but, but if, if we can open up our thinking, and, and believe, you know, you talk about uh, efficacy now, and, 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 and believe that all of them can achieve. I said, we, we can make this happen. You know, there's, there's, a, there's, there's, there's this book title I have. It's, uh, Is My School a Better School? Because I Lead It. But then in the Teacher 50, there's, there's an equivalent question that I wrote for the teacher. It says, are my students at an advantage because I am their mm -hmm. teacher, right? So here, I'm saying to the leader, I'm saying to the teacher, is this youngster better off because of you? It's really easy to criticize. And I think this is something that's becoming more apparent in our world than ever. It's really easy to criticize others. But when they don't feel valued, do they listen? Do they care? Do they check out? Do they want to leave those spaces? And in education, if we really want to grow as individuals, if we want to help our students grow, we want to create that space where students are, feel safe being challenged because they know we got them. We, they know uh, we'll be there for them. If you look at reasons why, you're, why people are disengaged, a lot of them come down to other people. And so, you know, understanding that forgiveness is really about allowing somebody to not have so much control over your life, mm -hmm. um, not letting them off the hook for something that's really not about them anymore. And then, uh, you know, subsequently, sometimes mm -hmm. you have to, um, you know, you, you may not have been the cause of your issue, or you may not be the cause of your, uh, your disengagement or your issue or your anxiety or your depression or whatever it is. You may not have been the cause, but it is still your responsibility to heal. And that was, that was the point that when I woke up that one day and I'm like, oh my gosh, I totally, and that, there's a power in having, mm -hmm. in, in having that control. You know, it doesn't feel so outside of your scope of ability when you know that you have control over that. The leader's responsibility is to constantly have the pulse on the people to say, are my people doing well? And if not, how can I support them? Or how can we make a change in the system to make it better for them to do their job? Because ultimately it's about students and whether or not they're successful. So how can we support the people to make that happen? How are we listening to kids? How are we validating the kinds of learning that they do outside of school? Because gosh, was my, were my eyes opened when I started to meet some of these kids. And, and my stance in the library would change from, you know, put that away to, is that distracting you or helping you right now? And, can you, and, and when it's helping them, I have learned so much from kids. I think we have to be open to that as well, right? Like learn from smart people that you surround yourself with, be vulnerable, but also listen to kids and value the learning that they're doing. Basically take the story of Sergeant Pepper, take the story of the Beatles and, and, and I kind of break it down to what I, what, what I call the four riffs of the Pepper effect. Um, believe in your vision. You know, if if and 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 we talked a little bit about that before our 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 time on this is it's important to have that 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 vision and be true to your core. Um, so believe in your vision, believe in your masterpiece, believe that what you're doing is is la is going to last. Strive for it to last. Strive for it to be timeless and 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 universal and and good. Believe in your collaborators. Believe in those folks that. That, that you're working with. And then the fourth one, which we kind of touched upon, and, and, and I, you, you write it so beautifully in, in Innovator's Mindset and in and, and, and your work is ignore those naysayers. 
Well, number one, I think uh, that we've, you know, I think we see this going on right now. It makes me feel good. It's just, you know, it's a reminder that everybody needs connection. You know, the, the human connection is so important and not just teachers connecting with kids. We know that's important. Uh, but we also have to remind ourselves that somebody needs to be connecting with the teachers too, right? So there's this connection of everyone. And, and how can we do that more intentionally? So one, you know, if you're a principal, I would encourage you to make sure that you still have weekly meetings with your staff. If for no other reasons to bring people together, uh, to give them something to look forward to. But I still think it's important to have an agenda, uh, but not so structured. So you could do things where people are still doing some teaching, learning part of that meeting and so forth. But to give people that information. But um, so I think that's important. I think it's important for teachers right now to be checking in with their students at least every couple of weeks, just to check in how they're doing. Um, if they have opportunities to even interact with mom or dad or a guardian or whoever, grandma, grandpa, that's important too. But the one thing I've been thinking about lately, and I think this is the thing that I get a little nervous about is, I also think that right now when, when we have to make decisions, I still am a believer is that we should be bringing people together uh, to, you allow your team to help you make the decision. That's the world our kids are going into. And um, we as educators are embracing it more, I think, in a lot of cases and, and trying to model that, um, that, you know, it's not going to be some perfect final product that we're going to be able to, um, to, to accomplish, but we're willing to um, kind of innovate along the way or, um, what's the word I hear that somebody use? Iterative. It's an iterative process. Right. So, I mean, it, it's true. And, and we just need to talk about, like, not be afraid to fail. Like, and because our failure is going to be in, again, I'm speaking to the choir because you say this all the time <laughs> in some of your talks, but we're going to learn a lot more by falling on our face than if we just yep. stay in the same mundane um, kind of tactics that we're using now. So really getting them to concentrate on what does it take to get to that end result. Whether they get there that time or not, doesn't matter, I believe, as much as that we're concentrating on the character traits, the effort, and then saying, and when, as you're practicing, right. as you're putting in the effort, look at you're getting better and better. And that goes back to that growth mindset. And so, of course, that is very much what us adults have to model. You know, when we want our kids to learn something, the best way is to model it. We want our students to learn something, the best way is for us to model it. And for us to also praise ourselves for right. the steps along the journey. Stories are the fuel for innovation. They're what inspire us. They are, um, you know, the they give us really pertinent ideas, but they also get our, the work that we're doing out to pe people in a really compelling way that goes beyond what a score uh, can tell people uh, about our students. And like one of the things that you often hear is like, how do we share information with our public um, to go beyond the scores? And I, I think stories are the best way. And what I find fascinating is when I talk about the idea of sharing stories to fuel innovation, Stories are probably the most traditional teaching practice we've used uh, in our lifetimes. It's probably the oldest teaching practice that there is. And I think it's really powerful to think of it this way. Basically, you know, made sure that I connected with them like mm -hmm. every day, you know, even if it, even if they weren't in trouble, you know, it's because I wanted to, I wanted to change it. I became visible, right? I became visible in the building. So the only time that, you know, I, that they saw me, the general student population was not just when something bad happened, but I, I started just, you know, being, being around and, and, and making connections with the kids. And then, you know, what happened, what started to happen was the students actually didn't want to let me down. Right. Mm -hmm. Like they, right. they didn't want to come to my office and have me call their parents and they started feeling bad. So it, it really worked because now they had a reason, um, to do better like it wasn't about like external control and trying to make sure that you know i'm going to make you do something it really became internal which is important for any type of growth right there has to be a reason why you're doing it for yourself um, versus other people hi everyone it's george coast my daughter kalia and we're doing a little 
mini podcast. I'm going to interview Kalia. So Kalia, um, what is your favorite color in the world? Um, pink. Why is it pink? Because it's super pretty. Okay, it's super pretty. Okay, okay. Um, what is your favorite type of animal? An elephant. An elephant? Where have you seen an elephant before? Um, in the zoo and in the Palm Springs Zoo. Lots of places. In lots of places. Okay, and then the last question. What is your favorite thing to play? Um, do you like Lego? What do you like playing with? What is your favorite thing to play with? Is it Lego? Do you like making puzzles? Uh, it's um, the new bobblehead that Daddy gave me. <laughs> Do you like playing the new bobblehead? Yeah. Who's your new bobblehead? Um, Wonder Woman. Awesome. Okay, say bye to everybody. Bye.